Let us give thanks to the gracious and merciful God, the Father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, for he has covered us, assisted, preserved, accepted us, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour that us also ask him, the Almighty God, to keep us in peace this blessed day and all the days of our life. The Lord, Master and Almighty God, the Father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you on every occasion and every condition for all things. For you have covered, assisted, preserved, accepted us, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Pray that God may have mercy and compassion upon us. Hear us, help us, and accept the supplications and prayers of his saints for that which is good in our behalf at all, all times, and to forgive us our sins. Lord, have mercy. Therefore, we ask and appeal to your goodness, a lover of mankind. That you grant us to conclude this blessed day and all the days of our life in peace and in your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the works of Satan, all intrigues of the wicked, rising of enemies seen and unseen, to cast away from us, from all your people, from this holy church that is yours, as for those things that are good and profitable to provide for us, for you have the power to upon serpents and scorpions. Have all the power of the enemy. Lord, have mercy that we may praise you with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, for you have come and saved us. Let us pray. Stand up for prayer. Peace be with you. And we will Again, let us ask God the mighty, the Father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. We ask and entreat your goodness, Allah, remain kind. Remember, O Lord, the sick among your people. Lord, have you have busy with your mercies and compassion, heal them, take away from them and from us all sickness or maladies, the spirit of all sickness, chase away those with long lane in sickness, raise up in comfort, those afflicted by unclean spirits, set them all free, those in prisons or in dungeons, those in exile captivity, those held in bitter bondage, O oh Lord, set them all free and have mercy upon them, for you are he who loses the bound, uplifts the fallen, the hope of those who have no hope, the help of those who have no help, the comfort of the faint heart of the harbour of those in storm. All souls that are distressed, the Lord, grant them grace, grant them help, grant them salvation, grant them the forgiveness of their sins and their iniquities. As for us too, O Lord, the illness of our bodies, heal those of our souls to the cure. O you, the bishop of all flesh, visit us with your salvation. Lord, have mercy. Let us sing the angels of flame, glory to God in the highest, and good towards men. We praise you, bless you, accept your worship, we confess you, glorify, we give thanks to you for the great glory. O Lord, King of Heaven, God the Father, Pantocrator, O Lord, the Holy God and Son, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit. O Lord, God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, taste away the sin of the word of mercy in us. 
For you takes away the sin of the world, receive our prayers unto you, sit to the right hand of his Father, have mercy on us. You only are the Holy, you only are the Most High, my Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God the Father, amen. Every day I will bless you and praise your holy name forever and unto the ages of ages, amen. From the night season, my soul wakes early unto you, my God, for your precepts put a light upon the earth. I was meditating on your ways here, become a helper unto me. In the morning you shall hear my voice, early I stand before you, and you shall see me. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, who is more than virgin, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, who is crucified fire for us, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, who rose to the distant heaven, have mercy upon us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and unto ages, ages, amen. Holy tree, day mercy upon us. Holy tree, day mercy upon us. Holy tree, day mercy upon us. The Lord forgive us our sins, the Lord forgive us our iniquities, the Lord forgive us our trespasses. The Lord visit the sick of your people, heal them for the sake of your holy name. Our fathers and brethren have fallen asleep, the Lord oppress their souls. O you who are that sin, the Lord have mercy on us. You who are that sin, Lord help us and receive our supplications. Yours the glory, the dominion, and triple holiness. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord bless some men. Thanks for everything. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be thine, earth is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, if we trespasses, we be those who trust in angels, lead us not temptation, the rest is from evil one. Jesus Christ, Lord, thine skin, the power and glory. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, and men, Lily, I held to you. We ask you, a saint, for the glory of the Virgin, to God, the Mother of Christ. Hail the Holy Virgin, and brought forth unto us the true light, Christ our God. O Virgin Mary, the Holy Theotok was the faithful advocate for all mankind. Hail to you, O Virgin, the very and true Queen. Hail to the bride of our race, who has born to us, Emmanuel. Remember us, O our faithful advocate, before our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may forgive us. Fasting and prayer, the salvation of our souls, purity and righteousness, they are what please God. Fasting has raised Moses up to the mountain till he received the law for us from the Lord our God. Fasting has raised Elijah up to heaven and has saved Daniel from the den of lions. Our Lord Jesus Christ fasted for us forty days and forty nights to save us from our sins. And we too, let us fast with purity and righteousness, and let us pray, proclaiming and saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come for thine is the glory forever. Blessed are you, O Mary, the wise and the chaste, the second tabernacle, the spiritual treasure. Turtle dove who declared in our land and brought to us the spirit of consolation came upon your son in the waters of the Jordan as in the type of Noah for that dove has proclaimed glad tidings to us the peace of God for likewise you O our hope the spiritual turtle dove have brought mercy unto us, carrying him in your womb. He is Jesus, the begotten of the Father. He was born of you for us, setting free. Therefore let us declare first with our hearts, then also with our tongues, proclaiming and saying, O our Lord Jesus Christ, make for yourself within us a temple of your Holy Spirit, glorifying Share in the Oti Parthenos, the Ura in Mina Lithini, Share of Shoshan Taping, and as a egg for none in the Manoil, Tenti Hawa, Ripen, maybe your table or Stati, set in Hot Naharim, and Joyce the Bechristo. Pub Kirill lost the six, the truly honored, who founded us in the true Orthodox faith. Your name is a pride, a pure monk. The strength and hermit, the friend of me. For you have become a leading example of words, love and deeds, and of purity in faith. Hail to you, loving Father, who healed the sick and foresaw miracles and cast. Your era was blessed, O oh, our honored Father. You restored St. Mark's relics and made the sacred Mayron. Mary, the Mother of God, appeared miraculously with doves and incense about her church. In 
You built a new cathedral in St. Mena's great monastery and many more churches, but you remain humble. You rose at dawn, birth in health and sickness to praise with the angels and your beloved. And now remember us before our God that he may keep us in his love and faith. Praise the Lord on our behalf, our Holy Father, Patriarch, Ask of him whom you have borne, our good Savior, take away our troubles. Hail to you, O Virgin, the right and true Queen. Hail to the pride of our race, who bore to us Emmanuel. We ask you to remember us. O oh, our faithful advocate before our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may forgive us. And we honor your mother, true light, glorify your Holy Virgin, Mother of God, who gave birth to say the Lord, he came and saved our soul, glory to your mask, King Jesus Christ, proud the apostles, crown of the martyrs, join the rights of the church, mercy to preach, holy to one divine worship, honor Lord and mercy, Lord and mercy, bless them. Amen. Truly believe in the Holy Spirit, truly believe in one God, the Almighty God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Son of the Father, the four all ages, light of light, true God of true God, God are not made of commencement with the Father, through whom all things came into being. He descended from heaven for us and for our salvation, and was incarnate with the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary became man. He was crucified at the time of Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, rose, and then the third day, according to the scriptures, he ascended to heaven to sat at the right hand of his Father, he goes come back in glory, judge the living and the dead, of whom he not be near, and truly believe in the Holy Spirit, light and love, and the Father. The worship and glorify and tell the Father and the Son and spoke in the prophets and one holy verse that was told their church and all baptism for the mission of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world. God have mercy on us, set all mercy upon us, and have compassion upon us. God us and help us. Amen. Take your anger away from us. Visit us with your salvation and forgive us our sins. Amen. Look here, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, 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 oh,
अपने अपमा जे आख आख सोची the life giver and the holy spirit righteous is the son the lamb of god and praised by the heavenly host with his glorious father and the holy spirit helper and giver of life the spirit of god spirit of truth the comforter one trinity the father and the son and the holy spirit honored and exalted is the father from all the tribes and all the tongues and praise with jesus christ his son and the holy spirit compassionate is the word of god the good shepherd who was crucified for our sins and saved us from with the holy spirit seven times every day i will praise your name with all my heart a god of every one remember your name i was comforted a king of the ages and god jesus christ our true god who has come for our salvation was incarnate he was incarnate of the holy spirit and of mary the pure and changed our sorrow and all our troubles to joy for our heart and total rejoicing let us worship him and sing to his mother mary the and let us all proclaim with the voice of joy saying share in maria mother of emmanuel share in maria salvation of our father adam share in maria the mother of the refuge share in maria the rejoicing of eve share in maria the joy of virgin Share in him, Maria, the joy of Abel, the just. Share in him, Maria, the true virgin. Share in him, Maria, salvation of Noah. Share in him, Maria, the chaste and undefiled. Share in him, Maria, the grace of Abraham. Share in him, Maria, the unfaith. Crown, shed in him, Maria, redemption of Saint Isaac, shed in him, Maria, the mother of share in him maria the rejoicing of jacob share in him maria myriads of myriads share in him maria the pride of judah share in him maria the mother of the master preaching of moses share in him maria the mother of the master share in him maria the honor of samuel share in him maria the pride of it share in him maria the friend of solomon share in him maria exhortation of the righteous share in him maria redemption of isaiah share in him maria the healing of a jeremiah share Maria, knowledge of Ezekiel, share in him, Maria, the grace of Daniel, share in him, Maria, the power of Elijah, share in him, Maria, the grace of Elijah, 
Shedinim are the mother of God. Shedinim are the mother of Jesus Christ. Shedinim are the beautiful dove. Shedinim are the mother of the Son of God. I mean, if Oron Teti here in Moinan, take here in Semdinan, and take here in Kanan, no, be not. I mean, if or on Teti here, my non and take here, send the non and take here, he can't know me, non evos, bless the enemy of the church and fortify her that she may not be. Emmanuel, our God, is now in our midst with the glory of his Father and the Holy Spirit. May he bless us all, purify our hearts, and heal the sicknesses. of all our We worship you, O Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, for you have come and saved us. Among the stars of paradise, servant of the Lord Jesus, the light of the Baramos, Peniota of Akirillos, Emmanuel chose him, he determined to resign and be servant of the gospel, Peniota of Akirillos. Nonsense. The mention of your name is in all the believers' mouths. They all say, I got a poker on loss. Help all of us. Christos is a spent choice. No, be on so kiri. Irni Pasi. My master, Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Son, looks with the Father's broken one of our sins, without him liking sufferings. Who breathe in the face, behold, so simple, and said to them, Receive thy Holy Spirit, whose sins forgive, they are forgiven. Those you retain, they should be retained. Now also, our master, you've given the grace to those works in the priest of your holy church, to give sin upon the earth, to bind, to visit every bond of iniquity. Now we also ask you, love of mankind, for your servants, my father, my brethren, my weakness, and those who bow the head for your holy glory. 
grant us your mercy and listen every one of our sins. And if we commit sin against you, knowing you unknowingly, through anguish of heart or in legal faint heartedness, do, O Master, who knows the weakness of men's lover of mankind, grant us the forgiveness of our sins, bless us, purify us, absolve us, heal us of your fear, bestow upon us your holy will for our God and God's due to you forevermore. Amen. Minna lilla jag dock säger tre ke och jag gör nåm mat i kan jag inte stå så jag nås då nu och nåna den och jag vill en god måste jag bli en joy Jesus be rest och Jesus Christ var sitt för oss var det dagen fortin oss så det är mona vana i nån kiri elai son kiri elai son kiri flogi son av min små ero nå ero istället än jag kunde vara god vi är små Jesus var en nåti min esse show King of Peace grant us your peace establish for us your peace Give us our sins. Yours is the power, the glory, the might for Amen. Lord, will make us worthy to pray together, saying, "Our Father." Hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth in heaven. This is our daily bread. For us, 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 In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Um, so just to give you a bit of an idea of what we're doing tonight, we'll um, have some hymns now. Um, and the hymns team have actually prepared and created a new hymn, uh, which they have designed to celebrate the feast of Pope Krollos. Um So I'm going to invite um, Dan to explain to us um, how this theme this lyrics came about and how this hymn came about um, and hopefully it'll be a, a hymn that we will be singing time and time again to commemorate the life of Kualos. Um After a few hymns we may then um, invite Bunadan up and, um, and we'll have a bit of a discussion around the life of Pakrolos and after that we'll have celebrate the liturgy. Um, so Dan, you ready to tell us a little bit about this hymn? Um, first, I actually don't know much about Pope Carlos outside, <laughs> outside of what Father Dan said in his sermons. I haven't read the book, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, no. So what, what I gathered from, like, well, what seems to be the impression of Pope Carlos is, um, like, when I tried to figure out how to dis describe him, um, I don't know, just the, the image of a window came. Because um, the window brings in light, but it's not the source of light. But without the window, that light can't shine through. Um, and also the other good quality of a window is a window that's not noticed like if you can see the window because it's dirty you, like, you wouldn't walk into it but when you've got those mad windows that you walk straight into it's because oh, I didn't notice you there I was just focused on the light that was coming through you um, so I don't know that just for me was like a good lesson in terms of like the silent patriarch just trying to be unnoticed um, and through that process, he was able to bring in light to like a really, really dark era. Um, and also the impact that it has on other people. Like imagine if we didn't have Pope Carlos. Imagine if we didn't have holy people around us. Um, the cost of that, of people that they would have influenced. And think about your own lives. Like you're probably here because of someone. If that person wasn't holy or didn't love God, would you be here? And think about it for yourself. Like am I holy? Am I bringing people other? Uh, other people to Christ, or am I like a dirty window that's not bringing that light, um, that's not reflecting Christ's, sorry, Christ's light to others?
we'll sing Who Am I together. the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my heart. Who am I that the bright morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Oh, I am flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the winds. Do you hear me when I'm calling? Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. You've told me who I am. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes that see my sins would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain? And calm the storm in me Not because of who I am But because of what you've done Because of what I've done But because of who you are I am flower quickly fading Here today and gone tomorrow A wave tossed in the ocean a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. And you've told me who I am. I am yours. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for that, and uh, especially for that beautiful hymn. We gave them about two or three days' notice to produce that, so it's um, it's lovely. Thank you. Um, we'll invite Abuna Dan up. Yeah. So before my other Father Mark gets into it. Um, can I get all of you to come closer? It is too far away. It's very, very annoying. And if I'm annoyed, I'm just not going to talk. <laughs> so can we get everyone to come up? So how about the front section? Just the front. There's three sections, just the front section. At least that way we can see each other. It's intimate. There's a nice ambience about it. So the front section... So I will allow anyone that has kids to go in the second section. <laughs> but if you don't have kids or you don't currently have kids inside you, please come to the front section. All right, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, so as you all probably know, the, the reason why we've asked Abuna Dan to be with us today is that Abuna Dan has written... Um, a book, a significant work on the life of Pope Krolos. Um, it's interesting, this book was published by St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York. St. Vladimir's Seminary is an Eastern Orthodox, the most prominent Eastern Orthodox seminary in the world. Um, and it wasn't just an achievement that um, St. Vladimir's would publish this book because, of course, St. Vladimir's is extremely selective in what they publish. They don't just publish anything. They are very selective. So it's not only an achievement that St. Vladimir's Seminary were interested in publishing this book, 
But to add to that, it was not an Eastern Orthodox character. It was a Coptic Orthodox patriarch, a Coptic Orthodox author. Um, not only that, but it became the best-selling book that St. Vladimir's Seminary has ever published. Um, a Coptic Orthodox patriarch by a Coptic Orthodox priest becomes the top seller in the most prominent Eastern Orthodox seminary in the world. Um, so it is a, a remarkable achievement, um, not by Abuna Dan, but, but the life of Pocolus that, that was captured the hearts of so many people. Um, so we're here to discuss a little bit about um, this book, um, and um, I'll be asking Abuna some questions, and we have an hour. So um, make it, feel free to make it like a discussion. So if you have a question as you're going, put up your hand and you take over the next question in the interview. It's not all, it doesn't all have to be my questions. So feel free, we're, we're all close together. Just put up your hand and you get the next question. It doesn't have to be my one, okay? So it's a chance. Um, it's the first time Boyan Dan has accepted to be interviewed about his work. So take the opportunity that we have uh, before us. So before we get into it, I remember like Abuna, I'm pretty sure um, a while back, after he, you wrote your first book, um, you, we were talking, and you said to me, what do you think my next book should be about? And I'm pretty sure I said, Pope Crawlers. <laughs> and then you said, you reckon? And I said, 100%. And that was it. The next thing I know, Pope Crawlers' book is published, all right? <laughs> but then when I was reading the acknowledgements in the beginning, my name was not mentioned in the acknowledgements. I just want to clear the air uh, before we get going. Um, Baba? That's actually very true. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that actually because I remember I was, I was thinking of when I was working on my PhD whether I was going to work on St. Paul or whether I was going to work on Pope Cronulla's. And so I did ask Abuna Mark and so he did uh, forcibly tell me to work on Pope Cronulla's and said it would be a big waste if I didn't. <laughs> so I probably should have mentioned him in the acknowledgements. I yeah. do apologize. Next version, me. next release. Ne or next release, <laughs> I'll, I'll make a correction. Um, I think um, before we get into it as well, just, I don't know, Buna, if there's anything that, uh, like, besides my comment, anything that really drove you to want to dedicate so much time and effort into writing about somebody like Pope Carlos? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I actually don't know 100% the answer. Um, one of the things that... I think like most people, there's probably a bit of personal experience with Pope Carlos. Um, I'll tell you one story, which isn't too personal, and so, but it give, gives you a sense of, of that feeling. I was working on my thesis when I was in engineering, and we had spent a whole year working on this engineering thesis. It was like a, a digital guitar um, amp that with a digital module in the front of it. And so we were, my friend and I were working on this for a whole year, and it worked perfectly. Like, it was brilliant. And then it came to the day before we were submitting, and all of a sudden, it just crashed. And there was just rubbish being poured out and spat onto the screen of just rubbish. And we couldn't figure out what it was. And we sat there, we were looking at the PCB, like one of those circuit boards, we were looking at the programming, we couldn't figure out what it was. And we spent an entire day, when I say entire day, I mean we were up to 23 hours, trying, 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 until eventually I got really frustrated because we'd spent so much work that I said, all right, all right, enough pop corners. And then the screen just stopped, literally stopped after 23 hours. And so then my friend looked at me and said, what'd you do? And I said, I didn't do anything. He said, no, what'd you do? You did something. He said, I saw some movement behind me and then it stopped, it was Greek. And then I said to him, look, I'm gonna tell you, but you're not gonna believe me. And so I told him, I just said Pope Kronos and it stopped. And he goes, okay. And that was it. We didn't talk about it again. We submitted it straight away on the spot after that. We got an incredible mark for it. And unexplainable. Just a word. Yeah. And you can call that coincidence, but that's actually the coincidence that I experienced that almost everyone had. When I was in Egypt and researching on Pocrollos, I couldn't almost meet a family that didn't have some experience with some relative. One lady that I met there, who I know personally, as I was talking to her and I was telling her, oh, yeah, I'm working on a book of Pope Crawlers, she said to me, oh, I need to tell you what happened to me. She was an old lady. She said, I had severe pneumonia and they were trying to force me to go to hospital. And my daughter, who's a, who's a doctor, 
was there and saying we have to go. We, we're listening to your lungs and we're hearing just rubbish in your lungs. It's just filled with God knows what pus or something. There's no air moving in your lung. She said, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going. And then as she was standing there, Pope Carlos, I think, was visiting somebody else in their apartment building or something like that. And so she just heard him. Or she prayed to him, something along those lines. And then she felt a sharp stab in her back. And then she said, no, I don't need to go to hospital. I can breathe better again. So her daughter thought she was trying to put it on and had listened to her lungs. Perfect, pristine. That story was multiplied by a thousand. Literally everyone you could find. And so he was a real anomaly, um, an anomaly of a human being. And I think that's what it was. That I was probably, you know, maybe f through his pushing, I don't know, maybe through a Buddha Mark's pushing that I didn't acknowledge. Um, but a, a really intense feeling that if something is not done now, it'll be entirely forgotten. And like everything else in our, you know, probably church in our culture, is that things get over-amplified that sometimes don't need to be over-amplified. And so this started to become an obsession about the miracles, when all you would do is hear about miracles, 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 and we forget what is the source of those miracles, what is happening underlying his life that would produce such a life like that. And so probably over time I started to feel that if something's not done, it won't get done. And if it does get done, it probably won't get done properly. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, and just again, before we dive into the actual life of Pope Krolos, could you give us a little bit of an overview of the environment in which he began his papacy? Like, what did um, the church look like? Um, people refer to it as a time of darkness. What exactly was the landscape of the church that, that he inherited? Yeah. So as I said to Father Mark just before we began, I said to him, please don't ask me any specific questions because my mind is like a USB. So when I'm working on something, I'll, I'll know it quite well. But the second I stop working on it, it's like it gets formatted. And then I replace it with other things, and I can't remember anything about it. But then I told them, your brain's like artificial intelligence. It just like <laughs> learns on the spot. So what, watch it just learn on the spot and produce the answer. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so one of the things that's also another reason why I wanted to write the book is that a lot of things in church history get downplayed. And so because we are trying to always preserve the sanctity of the church, we whitewash things, we hide things, we cover over things. And the church before Pope Carlos was shocking. It really was shocking, especially in the probably 100 years before him. And that's not to say that everyone was bad and there was no such thing as a good priest, there was no good bishops, there was no good people, there were no you know, authentic liturgies being prayed. No, it's just the general state of the church was shocking, was shocking. To the extent that at the time of Pope Carlos, his synod, when he became patriarch, out of the synod, 16 members had bought their way into the synod, had paid money to become bishops. You know? The level of corruption was severe in the hierarchy of the church. And there were always good priests and good bishops kind of calling that out. But it was dark. It was really dark. And another way that you can know how dark it is, is that you look at people when they're young and their perspective of it. So Pope Shenouda, for example, when he was later on, he wouldn't really talk about the darkness so much. But when he was young, when he was a university student, he was the editor-in-chief of the Sunday School magazine. And so you can actually read his opinion on the church, and it's fierce. It's rough. He's calling out bishops. He's calling out the patriarch. He's calling out everyone on how corrupt things were at the time. And I think if we deny that or we lose sense of that, then we also lose sense of the life of Pope Carlos and just how transformative it was, how the church shifted. And it also gives us then a bit of hope that if we see something in the church, I mean, these days you've got awesome priests, so there's no problems. But, I mean, especially at St. Mark's, but you, you have a lovely, beautiful church. But if you see things that are not good, instead of going, ah, oh, the church is stuffed, I'm out of here, you're all corrupt, and the rest of the verbal diarrhea that comes with it, Instead of getting to that stage, you start to appreciate, well, the church back then was infinitely worse and was transformed by someone that was just holy. And that means that's our response to it. That's our response to it. And that should be our response from here on, that if there is any, anything that we see that is imprecise, incorrect, um, even, you know, dare I say, corrupt, that that should be our response. But yeah, it, it, was, it was very bad. Yeah. Very bad. So we, we all... Um I mean, a lot of us read the book, and um, 
uh, I think this book is probably the best book I've read in my life, uh, hands down. I, um, I was going on a cruise with my family, a seven-day cruise, and it had just come out before this seven-day cruise. I took it with me onto this seven-day cruise. And um, I spent the whole cruise with this book, and I finished it before I took off th this ship. Um, my wife was very suspicious of why I kept hiding in different places around the um, <laughs> ship with this book. Um, but it really made me th see things in a different light, especially his path to holiness. I mean, we see Pope Krolos as this miracle performer, um, a saint, an intercessor. But what do you, what do you, do you find, Abuna, is, is the real ingredients that got him to this point in his life? What's the mystery behind uh, Pope Krolos that, that made him this uh, mysterious miracle performer, a person who revived the church in no time? I mean, this is beyond human. What's underlying the mystery of Pope Krolos? I think one of the things that is very clear in his life was there was an obsession, obsession about God. He was obsessed with God. Um, it was the one thing needful. You can read his letters even when he was just into the monastery and was writing letters to his nephew. And the letters that he writes to him, it is an obsession. He talks about this idea of being incredibly focused. When you walk even, don't look left, right, just pray the Jesus prayer. When you get home, eat. Wash your face. If you need a bit of exercise, go into the, you know, into what he called the mountain or the, or the desert around you and get some fresh air. Then come back quickly. Don't waste too much time. Go back to your prayers. You know, go back to your scripture. There was an obsession about him. He was really um, quite remarkable how singular he was. Um, St. Isaac the Syrian, who Pope Carlos loved, used to describe, um, or the hero for St. Isaac the Syrian was the, the solitary, the one that is by himself, the hedger in, in, in Syriac. And so that was the concept for Pope Krolos calling himself when he was a monk, Father Mina, the recluse, al the um, my Arabic is terrible, but you get the point, the recluse, the solitary. And the word itself in Syriac means the one that is so singularly united, united in himself and united to God. There's no fragmentation. There's no distraction. He's not being pulled in two different directions. He's got one focus. And it seems that for Pope Krolos, that was it. You know, he was so focused on Christ, and that was it. In terms of practically how that came about, I think it's very, very clear. He suffered. You know, he suffered incredibly from when he was a young monk until he became patriarch. And that's another thing that we often lose, is that we see him as this beautiful patriarch that everyone must have loved. He was hated, like really hated. I, I tried to give a sense of it in the book. But it was much worse. There were stories in there that I couldn't include because they were just shameful. The things that would happen to him. The way he was treated by his fellow monks in the monastery. The way he was treated by fellow bishops. Um, was really, really shocking. Um, I'll never forget that one of the, the bishops that I sat with, who was an abbot of one of the monasteries, was telling me that when he was a young monk, as he entered the monastery, all of the senior monks and the, and the bishops told him, don't go anywhere near Pope Coral. This is when Pope Cross was a pope, when he was patriarch. He said, don't get anywhere near him. The guy's a sorcerer. He does black magic. I have nothing to do with him. He goes, and so, yeah, he goes, I didn't. I had nothing to do with him for a number of years because I didn't want to go anywhere near him because I thought he was a fraud. You know, he was a sorcerer. That's one of the, probably one of the, the heaviest bishops that we have in the Coptic Church at the moment saying that. And the same story was constant, constant. And so we have this idea that he was celebrated. He wasn't. He was mocked and ridiculed. Um... At one point, even when he was patriarch, he was sick in 19, about 1968. He was a bit unwell. There was a movement even at that point, three years before he died, to try to get him off the throne. You know, we lose that sight, we're offside of that. And in the face of all of that, he was silent, completely still, never defending himself, always humble. And that probably comes back to what he thought, what he read in Isaac the Syrian, which was this idea of, you know, humiliation is the beginning of humility, if we bear it silent. Um, so practically, that's probably how he got there. And just following on from that, um, why did you call the book The Silent Patriarch? Um, yeah, so he was silent. He, he I, I think he only ever gave one or two sermons that we have any kind of record of, 
ever um, that we have any record of um, after being a patriarch. When he was a priest, there was probably a little bit more when he was an old Cairo, but very minimal, always a few words. Um, he never defended himself. So even when he was being attacked in the media and the newspapers, which was constant throughout his patriarchate, um, never defended himself, never came out, never published a correction, never tried to sue somebody, just silent. And it's unusual that the somebody that's the leader of millions doesn't talk, doesn't give sermons. He wouldn't even read his own ordination speech when he was ordained patriarch. He had another bishop read it for him. Um, he didn't want to speak. You know, and I remember when I was speaking to, to Father Rafael Avamina, who was his disciple and his secretary um, or his deacon for a good five years of his patriarchate, he said, he goes, he would never talk to anyone. So you couldn't even get a sense of his personality. He wouldn't share details of his family. No one knew anything about him. You know? I was shocked when I, when I started studying him that he had sisters. He had six sisters. No one ever knew who the sisters were. No one knew anything about them. His mother's name, no one knew his mother's name. You know? Even his own family that were close to him, they didn't know his mother's name. He just didn't talk. So I discovered very, very quickly, um, not to kind of you know, denigrate or, or, or be negative at all, but even those who were closest to him, even his disciples, had no idea about his personality. They only saw things from the distance, from externally observing them. But in terms of what he liked, what he didn't like, his reactions to things, nothing. Nothing. And so I asked Father Rafael Avamina this. I said to him, you know, he didn't really talk much. So how do you get a sense of his personality? Think about your friends. You know about each other because you talk about things a lot. And he said, no, he never talked. And especially if things were tough. If people were attacking him, if he was in a, a position of agony, if he was being ridiculed, if there was a major problem, he wouldn't talk at all. He'd retreat to the monasteries. And the only time you'd see him talking, he said, would be when he's at the altar. When he would stand at the altar, if the deacons were singing something, you know, their lovely long tunes, as they were doing that, his mouth was running. Non-stop. His mouth did not stop during the liturgy. Not in the microphone, just silently. And so Father Rafael Mena said, the only person he spoke to was Christ. It's the only person he spoke to. You know, besides his confession father, he didn't confide in anyone. He didn't talk to anyone. He didn't seek comfort in anyone. Just in Christ. It's quite remarkable. You know. Yeah. Anyone want to jump in before I move on? Okay. Um, you know, you spoke a little bit about the the landscape and the environment the church was in, the, the darkness that it was in. Um, but you have this remarkable person emerge from that. Um, and in the book, you you spoke a bit about how he must have had he must have been discipled by somebody, um, and you concluded that he must have been discipled by an ancient saint, uh, St. Isaac the Syrian. Could you walk us through how you build that connection between St. Isaac the Syrian and Pope Krolos um, and how that discipleship influenced his life? So, yeah, so, so he actually had a number of mentors um, when he was younger. So he had his, his confession father when he was in his church. When he became a monk, he had Father Abdul Masih al-Masudi, who was probably, uh, probably the most incredible monk alive at that time. And it's quite interesting, right? Because one of the things that we mistakenly think is that Pope Krolos was this illiterate, quiet guy. He never gave sermons because he couldn't give sermons. You know? He probably was incapable of giving sermons. He wasn't that educated. He wasn't theologically trained. Um, but that would be very strange, given that his spiritual father, when he was in the monastery, was literally the leading light, you know, was a theologian, was an incredibly, incredibly um, prolific writer by the name of Abdul Masih al-Masudi. And I remember Father Tadros Somalati, after, after he read the book, the first thing he said to me he was, he goes, thank God you finally have told people he's not illiterate. Because Father Tadros Malati knew him and was discipled under him. He said it's one of these myths that came out. That just because he was silent, that he must have been illiterate. Or that theology wasn't important or learning wasn't important to him. But it's actually the opposite. You know? When you look at his writings, they're full of not just patristic thought like the fathers, but they're also full of philosophy. You know? So he was obviously quite talented. He just chose silence for another reason. It, after... He then needed to find a spiritual guide after Father Abdul Masih Masudi died in about 1935. He went into solitude and he didn't have a spiritual guide at that point. And that's when it seems that he started reading a lot of St. Isaac the Syrian. 
Father Abdul Masih al-Masuri, before he died, asked him to um, transcribe or to copy out a manuscript. You know, back then they haven't got printers. So they would copy out manuscripts and create another volume of it and give it to one of the monks. And so he did that, but he kept doing it. He did it four or five times until those words entered him. And when you read the writings of Pope Cronus, when you hear what people say that he used to say, when you see um, he used to like leave cards or little posters that he put around his room of sayings, like one of them is, um, love all men but keep distant from all men. That's actually a saying from Isaac the Syrian. All his writings, a lot of his advice was directly from St. Isaac the Syrian. The way he lived his life was directly from Isaac the Syrian, especially when it came to things like silence. And so it seems that after copying out and writing out these, these writings so many times, these words entered into him and they became his own words. And so really, if you spend a lot of time reading Isaac the Syrian, which I had done just by luck beforehand, and then read Pope Carlos, you just see they're one and the same. It's like the writings of a son of a father. You know? It's quite remarkable. Um, it's quite remarkable. And so you just see how that, you know, immersed it, how immersed he was in it and how much it must have transformed him. And then it's really interesting because if that's the case, then that means really the revival of Coptic monasticism, the revival of the Coptic church, really is due to a Syrian in the 7th century, you know, 8th century, which is really interesting. So, I mean, looking at that um, idea of discipleship, that Pope Carlos was discipled under uh, that, that monk as well as St. Isaac the Syrian, like for us, how important is this concept of discipleship? Um, you know, we think of Pope Carlos as a, as a standalone. We, don't, we never think of him being, di being a disciple of somebody else. Mm. Um, is it important for us to have this concept of discipleship? Um, if so, how and, and are we doing it? Like, are we really being discipled by somebody? Um, you know, just bring it back to us. What do you think? Yeah, yeah I, I think so, absolutely. I mean, that's one, again, one of the mistakes is that we try to pick out certain figures and then look at them independently from everyone else. But when you look at Pope Carlos, he was discipled by a number of people. And then he was discipled under what you call like a patristic discipleship, under this looking at just being guided by a text by the writings of St. Isaac the Syrian, the ascetical homilies. But then you see after that every single reformer in the Coptic church in the last 50 years came from Pope Carlos. And so when he spent some time, he was in Old Cairo as a, as a monk, as a monk priest before he became patriarch, um, mainly because they didn't like him in the monasteries and he didn't want to go to the monasteries. And so he, would st he stayed in this church and kind of created his own mini monastery um, in Old Cairo. And while he was there, there was this exodus of youth. So basically there was a whole bunch of youth that were moving to Cairo to study at the university. And as they were doing that, they were, might have been from Upper Egypt or elsewhere. They didn't have a home there. And so, you know, young guys in the middle of the city, not that it was a very enticing city being Egypt, but, you know, sin is potential. And so he tried to create this kind of um, hospice or harbor for them that they could find peace in. And so a lot of these young men would live with him. They'd pray with him, they'd work with him, they'd study in the day, and then they'd come in the evenings and they'd pray with him. And so these men were literally, pick a name, you know. Amber Athanasius of Venezuela, Pope Shenouda, Abu Nimat al you know, Amber Samuel. Um, literally pick a name and you'll find them there. I counted, I think when I went through it, something like 20, you know, of the obvious ones, the ones that lived with him and had direct knowledge of him. They were disciples under him. Every single one of them, even if they were there just for a year or two years, always says he discipled us. When these monks or these young men became monks, he sent them all to the Syrian monastery because there was a, a, an abbot there, Bishop Theophilus, who was appreciative of the fact of educated monks, whereas most of the other monasteries didn't want anyone that was educated because they didn't want fights because at the time no one was educated. And so if you get educated monks coming in and they start quoting church fathers, they start you know, thinking a little bit, then there might be some contention. And so they didn't want him, except for Bishop Theophilus. And so within about three or four years, he'd sent five, six monks. Within about 10 years, he sent about 20 monks. And so they became a group, and they called them the Sunday School Monks, the university educated monks. Um, that's actually what they called themselves, the Sunday School Monks or the university monks. Um, and at one point, there was a contentionist at the Syrian monastery. And when they left the monastery, they went back to him. He found 20 monks at his door, um, headed by Abu Namat al and Pope Shenouda. 
when they were young monks. And so you see this discipleship was always there. They'd always turn to him, um, and he was their guide. You know? And so for us today, I think it's something that we have to be very careful not to lose, very careful. It's one of the beautiful things about orthodoxy that really um, other churches have lost, this idea of discipleship. This idea of discipleship that doesn't necessarily have to be in terms of confession, although confession is a huge part of it, but a lot of it is just a spiritual guide. And that can be sometimes a, a very spiritual servant at church. That can be a mentor who is a woman, whatever it may be. But the idea is that I am exposing my heart to somebody. I am letting somebody guide me in some way to varying degrees. And I'm following after someone's path. In the same way that they've kind of walked to Christ, I'm learning from them how to walk to Christ. And I think if we lose that, we lose something really, really incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and then the sheer fruits of it, to see every reformer that came after Pope Carlos was one of his disciples. It's, it's, you, you can't measure that kind of success. You can't put it down to anything else. There's something very clearly happened in that house when they lived with him. There was an exposure to holiness. You know, and holiness is irresistible. You know, one of the things that I don't know if I talked about in the book or not, um, but we have some time, so I'll avoid some more questions by talking about it. Is there's a remarkable story that happened in the Greek church only in the in the, in the 1900s, the late 1900s, 19, 1980, 1990, or something like that, um, where there was a huge scandal in the diocese, which was already not that good, but they, were, they had a bishop who was really bad, and I, I, I you know, uh, it's a public you know, documents, so I won't kind of hide the details. But essentially, the bishop was all over the place, was known to be a womanizer. Um, and then, unfortunately, at one point, a photo came out that was published in the newspapers. And I want you to think about this, right? Published in the newspapers of the bishop in bed with a woman who was a priest's wife. Yeah? And there was a photo. So he couldn't deny it, and it was shocking. This is what happens when we go off track, off the questions. Yeah. <laughs> This would never happen, all right? But I mean, it happened. It happened, all right? It just shows you how bad things were. It was shocking. The whole diocese was already bad. Just went downhill. Everyone stopped attending church. Priests themselves tried to get out of the diocese because it was so embarrassing to be there. And then there was just disaster. Ten years of this diocese, a very, the diocese of Provetsa in Greece, that had nothing, nothing that was broken. How do you come back from that? And so there was a lot of discussions at the time of how do they solve this problem? What do they do about it? And one of the bishops in the synod suggested that there was a monk who had about, I can't remember what it was, seven or 11 monks underneath him that were just about to go to Mount Athos to start a new monastery. And they said to him, we want you to go to this diocese and we're going to ordain you bishop. And they made him a bishop. And so the same thing, almost parallels are happening with Pope Carlos. They asked him at press conference, what are you going to do? What kind of committees, what kind of programs are you going to do to kind of deal with this? And he said, no programs, no programs. But I will send you seven of the holiest priests you have ever seen. That's all he did. He sent them out throughout the diocese, nothing. No programs, no lectures, no nothing. Just seven holy priests. Within 10 years, that whole place turned around. You know, till now it's one of the most successful dioceses in Greece. Went from absolute rubbish to absolute glory. And so one of the things that he says, the bishop, that were, the, the monk that became the bishop there was, he said, nothing will bring people to church, not programs, not entertainment, not beautiful music, nothing will bring people to church like authentic holiness, an encounter with authentic holiness. And I think that's exactly what happened. Everything that happened in Pope Carlos's life to that point that he got to Old Cairo meant that they came into contact with the holy man. They came to contact with somebody that was transparent to Christ, and that then is the most discipling of factors. There's nothing like it. There really isn't. And that probably puts a lot more burden on us, on people who are serving in the church, on Sunday school servants, on anyone that's in a position of leadership, that that is the only way we should be serving. We should really be spending our lives trying to become holy, trying to become transparent to Christ, and that's, so that's who people meet. That's the greatest discipling method that exists, you know. Um, I just feel sorry for anyone that has to be discipled by me because you may be missing out. Go to Father Mark. <laughs> you may experience it. Fred, you had your hand up?
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think we can somehow mistake or sometimes mistake um, a deep love for God with meaning he doesn't need to struggle. There was definitely from young age very clear deep love of God, right, and a deep love of monasticism. But when you read his letters, when you read his autobiographical um, fragments, when he went out into the desert, for example, into solitude, when he was in the monastery and it wasn't satisfying enough for him and he wanted to go into solitude, after the first night he says, you know, <laughs> I, I, I will write to you of, you know, just how like, shocking it was what I went through, you know the attacks that he was experiencing. When he writes about, um, after three years of being in solitude, he writes, he goes, my body became emaciated. He goes, I was in, I was lost. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know which direction to go. I was confused. I was down, you know? And that's when he says, I saw the light. And so for those three years, 100%, he was suffering. We don't know to what degree, but from what he, the way he speaks about it, he was feeling like he couldn't even, he didn't know which direction to go. He was lost. He was confused in his spiritual life. Um, so certainly there was a huge amount of struggle, you know. Um, and he's, human, he's a human being. Any human being to fast like that, there is struggle. Any human being to wake up and to sleep that little. You know, well, I remember when I was in med school, I had a professor that was telling us about sleep and saying about how anyone that is like highly successful always underplays how much they sleep. You know, so if you get a president, if you have, I don't know, a CEO of some Microsoft or whatever, they always pretend they don't sleep. It's like a, a, a sign that I'm working so hard, I don't have to sleep. So like, you know, for example, Margaret Thatcher, or they, they talk about her that she would never sleep until they found in the back of her library, there was a secret door and there was a bed inside there so she could actually sleep. Um, and so the, the idea that every human being needs to sleep, because without sleep, you can become psychotic, right? You get down to four hours of sleep a night, three hours of sleep a night. It's actually very dangerous. It's not good for your brain. And then you look at Pope Krolos. He just doesn't sleep. And the thing is, all his disciples are witnessing what he's doing, so there's no hiding. There's no hiding. He would get home, he'd get to his room, he'd probably sleep about midnight. And yet he was up, this is later, when he was a patriarch, so he's in his 60s, and he'd be waking up at 3 to 4 a.m. There's only three to four hours you can sleep in that time. And then you look at his letters, and almost always, if he mentions a time, he'll mention 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. So that's when he's writing his letters. So when was he sleeping? You know? We can look at that and say, that must have been natural. That's impossible to be natural. That's what you call someone that has been so singularly focused their entire lives. They have beaten their body into submission. Even one of the things that, I don't know if it came out that well in the book, but... Um, when I was speaking to Father Rafael Avamina, I said to him, were you ever afraid of Pope Krolos? He said, the only time I was afraid of him when he was sleeping. I said, I said why? He goes, every now and then I'd have to go on an errand or something and I'd knock on his door and walk in there and you'd find him in the room and the way he looked when he was sleeping was infinitely more fearful than he looked when he was awake. He goes, because he slept in an unnatural way. When he slept, he'd sleep on his side but you know when you sleep on your side, you bend your knees. It's the natural position of the, of the body. You go into kind of like a bit of a fetal position. He didn't. His legs would be entirely straight, like a pencil. But he'd be on his side. It's a very uncomfortable position to sleep in. And so he'd look at him, and he didn't know how. And obviously the reason he sleeps like that is because when he was a monk, especially was in the windmill, he didn't have a bed. He was sleeping on a pew, a church pew. And so when you're sleeping on a church pew, you can't bend your legs. There's not much room. That doesn't happen naturally. That's something that somebody had to really beat their body into submission so that their spirit was free. He did that with everything. He did that with food. He did that with, with his diet. He did that with his prayers. He did it with how much he sleeps. Everything. And the most thing, I think, was his mouth. He, he had to really struggle to be silent. You know, he had to really struggle to not react. Can you imagine, right? I always think about this. You know, in the in the Apocrypha or, or some of the early writings, which are not true, they're not biblical writings about Christ. There's one which talks about when Christ was a kid. You know, I don't know if you've ever read this, but it's actually quite funny. And so they write about Christ as a kid, and obviously he's God. Right? And so he's walking one day, and some other little kid walked past him and shoved him. So Jesus looked at him. He goes, ah! All of a sudden the guy's half his arm got paralyzed, and he couldn't walk. And so St. Mary had to get him Jesus. He goes, all right. All right, and his arm got unparalyzed. And you know, when I think about that, and I look at the life of Pope Krolos, he was ridiculed. 
He had people scheming against him while he was patriarch, while he was reforming the church. People were trying to get in the way. And you just imagine this guy that's walking around that is healing people so naturally, hundreds of thousands. He can't just kill them. He can't just look at them and paralyze them or stroke them, even though there were some people that happened to him. But he didn't. He said silent. This guy that could pray in an instant and change, move the hand of God, and yet when he's getting attacked, doesn't even open his mouth. That for me is something that must have been an incredible struggle. You know? Must have been really incredible struggle. So I, I don't think any of that happened naturally. I think he just didn't talk about it. You know? But I think it was something that he struggled with his whole life. Yeah. Just repeat that question for the sake of the streaming, for those who didn't hear Fred's question. But the, the, the question that Fred asked was, did Pope Paul struggle to reach his state of holiness and live a life of prayer? Um, and that was the, the question, answer that one evangelist gave. Any other questions from, from the floor? Yeah. Yeah, yeah say it and then I'll repeat it. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, the endowments. So it's, it's an Arabic word that just Excuse means... Me Oh, sorry. The question is, um, she's saying there's, in the book we talk about something which is called the waqf or the awaqf or something along those lines, which is the endowments. What, the, what happened was the church had investments. So you had monastic lands which had like hundreds and hundreds of hectares um, of sometimes valuable land that they then turned to agriculture. So they would then receive a rent or an income from those lands. That, l that income, which was the collectively the waqf, would then go into the church that should have been used by the church for projects. So when the church was going through this very dark period that I said, especially in the, probably from the 1890s to about 1950 in that period, um, that was the symbolic kind of treasure chest that everyone wanted to put their hand on. So everyone that wanted to reform the church wanted to access it so that they could then do programs for the poor, education, literacy, whatever it may be, buy new churches, whatever it is. Then you had the bishops, the monks, who, who you know, were in charge of these um, endowments because they were their land, that were like, no, we don't want you to touch it. And so everyone was fighting over it. And so you had this huge battle that went on for 60 years between the lay people, who were often more educated, uh, more savvy financially, um, than this uneducated class of bishops and priests, because back then most priests and, and you know, bishops were uneducated. You know, they didn't go to university, whereas lay people were at that time. And so there was this constant contention. That eventually became so bad that there was a group called the Maglis Emili, or the, the, if you like, the, the big church committee of lay people that were fighting with the popes. And so for the three patriarchs before Pope Carlos, there was ongoing fights in the media, um, everywhere. There was electioneering, there was bribery, there was any, everything. Everyone was fighting. And they're all fighting generally from a good place. You know, the Magdalene Emilia, the lay people, thought we could do a better job of this than those spiritual people that have no idea about how to you know, open a bank account. So we should be in charge of the money. Then you have the church saying, no, these lay people don't understand the spiritual needs of the people. We understand the spiritual needs of the people. We should be the ones taking care of it. And unfortunately, because of the corruption, it just became this terrible, terrible minefield. So that was, you know, Probably, you know, I, I called it the mummy's curse in the book because everyone that touched it was literally, you know, was cursed. Everyone, you know, everyone. Um, and that went well, well into the time of Pope Carlos, even went into the time of Pope Shinoda a little bit as well. But Pope Carlos was quite good at the way he managed it. When we have a generation of um, children either called uh, Carlos or Mina, <laughs> Um, it's very confusing when you have a Sunday school class and half of them are mean and other half are Carlos. Um, but somehow, and we always see the icons of Pope Carlos with Saint Mina. Um, what's the uh, correlation between Pope Carlos and Saint Mina, and how did this connection become so strong? Yeah. So they were well, Pope Carlos at a young age seems to have developed some kind of affinity for Saint Mina. His name is actually Saint Minas but we shorten it to Mina. But the original word is St. Minas. Um, and the idea was that somehow when he was younger, they used to go to a, a festival and there was a, a celebration for that saint and he came close to him. But what most people don't realize is St. Mina was not a known saint at the time of Pope Carlos. 
No one knew about him. No one talked about him. No one even called their kids mean at that time. You know? um, he was a very popular saint, but much earlier in the fourth century. He was probably the most popular saint internationally of any saint across the world. He was a very famous saint to the point that you can find in Pulai, which are kind of like water flasks with his inscription on them all around the world. And then, for some reason, a connection formed between Pope Carolus and St. Minot. We don't know why. We don't know what happened. But Pope Carolus, it's almost like St. Minot was next to him. There was a constant connection between them, a constant relationship. Even when you read his letters, at one point, um, and again, I didn't write in the book, um, just out of respect to, to Pope Carlos's family, but it seems at some point his, um, his brother's wife had, was trying for a, a, a child and had some kind of bleeding, some kind of vaginal bleeding that ended up, she was hospitalized for it. And when that happened, they wrote to Pope Carlos when he was a monk and said to him, pray for her. And so he writes back in this letter saying, I'm in front of the icon of Saint Nina right now and he's assured me everything will be fine. So I'm just waiting for the good news. Very simple. Very simple. We don't know what happened or why there was such a deep connection between them. Um, there's reasons I suspect that, you know, both of them were celibate. Um, both of them spent time in the desert. Both of them had the same experience of light. They described the same thing. Both of them lost parents when they were young. Um, so there's a lot of points of, 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 of connection between them. Um, maybe that's what it is. I don't, I don't know. But there was certainly a very unique relationship. Uh, Father Rafamila Vamina told me he was Pope Carlos in the, in the liturgy was still. He would not look to the side. He would not talk. Not like us checking our phones, checking our watches. He just would not. His face was still. Never laughs, nothing. He goes, then one day in the late 1960s, he goes, he was praying in the liturgy and he was walking out of the Shoria and then he just started cracking up. And so... Father Eflav Mina said, what happened? He goes, no, 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 don't worry about it. He goes, no, something happened, what happened? He goes, no, 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 I was just saying to say Mina that I've got this problem. And so he pushed me and said, what, you think we're not with you? And so I started laughing. I was like, okay. Just like that. You know, very natural. So there was obviously a very close relationship. And I think the reason is that, you know, for him, the spiritual world was not divided from the physical world. You know, the world was unveiled. He saw things as they were. And so for him, it was very, very clear. But it's a very unique relationship. Mm. So, I mean, if, if we're starting to piece together um, some of the influences that Pope mm. Carlos had on his life, one of them is this relationship, this deep relationship with St. Mina. Mm. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, how we can go about developing this kind of a deep relationship with a saint. Mm. Uh, maybe even Pope Carlos, you know, but, but what practical things could we be doing to have this deep spiritual friendship uh, with the saint, um, that, you know, what do you suggest? No, I think it's a great question. I, I think a big part of it is one of the things that we've lost a little bit, um, our parents probably had it much more than us, is this idea of, you know, tamgir or, or, or celebration of the saints or veneration of the saints. And I think it's something really beautiful, something that we need to probably focus, at least I need to focus a little bit more on. Um, of this idea of teaching our kids, even ourselves, to venerate saints and what it means. What it means that, for example, when I go past these icons, I don't just walk past them, you know. I stop, I bow, I kiss an icon. And then I think once that starts to happen, we become a bit more open to the spiritual reality of the world. The world is unveiled a little bit more. Then I think naturally we'll be drawn to particular saints and particular saints will be drawn to us. I mean, for sure, I think St. Mina um, is the one that picked Pope Carlos. I don't think it went the other way around. How could Pope Carlos be attracted to a saint that no one even knew about at that time? You know? I think it was the opposite. And he was perhaps using St. Mina as a, as Pope Carlos as a chance of revealing himself to the world again. Um, but I think we have to, first of all, have the attitude of really seeking the intercession of the saints, drawing near to them, reading the lives of the saints. You know, the thing that m I, I really find so fascinating is that if you read the lives of the saints, the original texts, they are incredible texts. And yet the majority of us, our knowledge of the saints, even of our patron saints, is via the Synexarian or something we found on Wikipedia. You know? And I wonder, maybe that's why. Maybe that's why. We just don't have care. We just don't have an interest. But if we learn to properly venerate, properly understand their life, then it's not just a matter of asking for their intercessions. 
their life becomes an example for me. The same thing that the life of St. Isaac the Syrian, the life of St. Menas became uh, an example, a paradigm for Pope Carlos. The same thing these saints can be an example for us in our lives, that we can try to walk to Christ in the way that they walk to Christ, with their love, with their intensity. Um, but I think certainly a big part of it to start is perhaps veneration. Mm. And I mean, you just mentioned that you believe that sometimes it's not just us that picks a saint, mm. but a saint that can pick us. Mm. Um, it's an interesting reversal. You know, we always mm. think that uh, I'll pick an, an intercessor, but we never think of an intercessor picking us. Uh, yes, I did exactly that. So I tried to look for any saint that would no one knew, because I'm trying to be a bit, you know, fancy. So try to find the saint that no one's got, because you know, everyone's asking Pope Carlos, St. George, it's the same Busy, thing. Yeah. I would like to be unique. Mm. Um, and I remember I was always, and I had some, I had like a couple of patron saints when I was younger. And then Pope Carlos kept cropping up like in that example, which is probably why I wrote the book. He kept cropping up time and time and time again until eventually I was like, all right, all right, no worries. We'll be friends. We'll be friends. We'll be friends. <laughs> um, so I think certainly, I think certainly it, it, it does happen. Mm. Not that he chose me. I'm not that special, but. Yeah. Um, no hands up yet? All right. Um, tell us a little bit about your trip to Egypt, to Borna, and how you managed to um, get your hands on unpublished private letters that Pope Carlos had written, and what it was like to be to be reading the works and the letters of Pope Carlos. How'd you get your hands on that? Um, yeah, so the first the first group of letters that I got was from um, someone called um, Morris Reda, who was. His nephew, so Pope Carlos's brother, um, Hannah, had a son, and that was a son that um, that's I can't recall how I first made contact with him. Like I told you, it's a USB, it's gone. But um, eventually, when I went to Egypt, I found him, and actually, I found him in the apartment building that Pope Carlos used to live in when he was when he was growing up. And so I went to him. He was blind, so I asked him about the blindness, <laughs> and I just asked him like after a while of getting a bit comfortable, a bit of rapport, how come Pope Carlos didn't heal you? And he said to me, my family took me to him. My brother, his, his Pope Carlos's brother, took him to him, took me to him, and said to him, you know, pray for him that he fix his blindness when he's about four years old. And he goes, then Pope Carlos said, no, it's better for him to stay as he is. I thought, oh, that's very interesting. And so he had this pristine memory. Couldn't see a thing since he was four years old, yet was able to direct me from Cairo Airport to his apartment go past this building, you'll see a, a sign over here, you'll see something else, then there's a big poster. I don't know how he knew these things, he's blind. Um, and so we were sitting in his, in his apartment, and I said to him, I got two letters from him when I was in Australia. I had uh, someone that was connected to him, and I got his phone number. And then I said to him, can I see the originals? Because you know, the, the, when, you got, when you scanned it, it was a bit blurry. And he said to me, oh, no, I don't have them anymore. I said, well, where are they? He said, no, no, they're going to knock down this building in three weeks. So we've packed everything into boxes, which was true. So I said, okay, no worries. But I'd like to see the letters. So after a bit of argument here and there, he went and got me the letters. But when he got me the letters, he brought two other letters. So I saw these other letters and I said, no, no, these are different to the other two letters. Do you have more letters? Because these are like gold. And then he said to me, no, 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 that's all I have. I said, no, 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 look at the photos you sent me before. These are different letters to these ones. Where'd you get these letters from? And then he looked to me and he said, no, I've got nothing else. And then I'm pushing, pushing. And then after a while, I said to him, he goes, look, he goes, I don't know where they are anyway. They're in a box. We've packed everything away. We don't know where everything is. And then everyone was getting really hostile in the room. But I wasn't going to let this go. So then I said to him, listen, listen, I'm a priest. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to make things up. But if I don't do this, the next guy that comes after me to do this, he's got a really bad job. He's going to do a really bad job. Just please give me the letters. He said, no. I said, listen, this is the history of the church. All right. <laughs> And then I started with my broken Arabic <laughs> clicking it. And then his wife got a bit agitated. And then she goes, no, we can't give you the letters because it's private things. I go, so there are letters. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her, you need to give me these letters. And so after a while, maybe another half an hour of begging, he goes, okay, Philo, go into the room, go to the drawer on the left, go through to the right, open it with the key that you find on top of the tzriha, open it, and then get it, and you'll get the collection of letters. And I go, oh, I didn't know where the letters were. <laughs> All right, the guy's blind and knows the directions exactly. All right. So then they came out with this collection of letters of about, I can't remember how many, it was about 19 letters. And I was like, this guy is just sitting on these. 
And so that was the first collection that, that I got. That was, thank God for that. And then after that, it was a disaster. So I was in Egypt, but I had limited time. And so I went to the Pope, met the Pope. The Pope gave me a letter. I said, yeah, of course, this letter will open up anywhere you want to go. I'd spoken to Amber Surreal before, who had mentioned to me that there was um, um, uh, like a patriarchal archives. So I went to the patriarchal archives, and they were confused. And everyone was looking at me in confusion. There were really old letters and documents, but there was nothing use useful. And eventually I realized what was happening was it was like financial archives. So you'd have this worker in the patriarchate in 1969 was earning, you know, five pounds. It's not going to help me. You know? And so I went through everything. We couldn't find anything. I spoke to the Pope again. The Pope goes, that's all we have. I go, where do you keep your synod records? Where's all the archives? Where's anything that happened during the patriarchate? He goes, that's it. I go, there's nothing here. He goes, I don't know. So I said, well, who knows? He goes, speak to this other bishop. I call this other bishop. And it went on for like a week of phone calls. I'd call a bishop. I'd get about five sentences in. I couldn't understand what they said. I'd give the phone to Abuna Philemon, who was a monk that was with me. He'd continue the conversation. And then we just go down this constant goose chase of trying to find with no, no success. And then eventually I spoke to a bishop who said to me, I know where all the synod archives are. You need to speak to Amber Bushoi. I go, all right, I'll speak to Amber Bushoi. He goes, all right. They're at St. Bushoi's monastery. I speak to the guy that's in charge of the archives of St. Bushoi monastery. He goes, yeah, about that. We did have a lot of documents. But remember that flood that happened like 12 years ago? Everything got flooded. Everything was destroyed in that room. All the, all the synod um, documents from Pope Shenouda's time and Pope Crawlis' time, gone. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, okay, it's flooded, but surely that's not the only copy of things. Okay, yeah, look, I'm going to tell you unofficially, but you need, I'm not going to tell you, because I'm not going to tell you, but unofficially I'm going to tell you to speak to this other bishop. So I call this other bishop. And I speak to the bishop. He goes, all right, Abun, I'm going to tell you, but don't write this down. So that's why I didn't write it down. He goes, when? So that was going against the church, against Pope Shenouda. There were two monks that were in charge of the patriarchal archives. Those two monks were scared that said that was going to come and get all the documents and use them against the church. So they burnt everything. I go, are you serious? And that's it. So everything was gone. So there are no synod documents. Everything was destroyed. So that kind of closed that, that avenue. There was not going to be any much success down there. I found little bits and pieces, but it, was, it wasn't very useful. And then at that point, I gave given up. I said, I've got my 19 letters. I'm just going to have to base everything off that. Then I went to visit um, St. Samuel's Monastery, which is like really far south, in the middle of the desert. So I get there, and as I'm there, the bishop was away of the monastery, which was a bit unfortunate, but I had the letter from the Pope. So I was just showing that letter to anyone that I could speak to. And the first monk that I met, I said, hey, I've got this letter. I need to access your archives. He said, look, I'm in charge of the archives. I'm the librarian. I said, oh, beautiful. Um, he goes, yeah, I've got everything. I've got letters. I've got everything. You know, Egyptians sometimes, how do I say this, over-exaggerate <laughs> um, what they can do until you actually push them and ask them to do it. You know? So that was, that was his situation. And so he told me, yeah, I've got this. I've got that. And then I'd go into there, and there's nothing. I couldn't find anything. So I said to him, listen, you told me you've got all these letters. He goes, I thought I had. I don't have anything. I can't find them. And then I kept pushing him and pushing him and pushing him. He said, look, maybe there's stuff inside Pope Crawlis' old cell when he was a monkey. Maybe. I said, all right, let's go in the cell. He goes, no, 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 no. We can't go in the cell. He goes, we need to get permission from the bishop. I said, no, I've got the letter from the Pope. He trumps the bishop. <laughs> he said, no, not in the monastery. I said, okay, so what do we do? He said, well, he's not here. He's in Cairo. I said, let's call him. He goes, we haven't got reception in the monastery. I said, so how do you call him if there's an emergency, if something's burning right now? He said, we have a satellite phone. I go, so use the satellite phone. He goes, yeah, the satellite phone only works an hour away on a mountain. And I go, well, what are you doing now? <laughs> let's go do it. I've driven all the way here from Australia. <laughs> you know, let's do it. And so then he goes, and after fighting for a while, I said, the Pope's going to be really upset. He gave me this letter. And then he goes, he goes, all right, no worries. So then he goes, he literally drove an hour away, spent about half an hour there, and then came back an hour later, and he's you, and said, all right, the bishop said it's okay. I said, let's go in. So then, before then, he was showing me the cell, and just opened the door, and then realized he shouldn't do it, and then closed the door. He goes, we have a problem. This was before this, before the satellite conversation. I said, what? Well, I said, do you remember when I showed you the cell? I left the key on the inside. 
I go, are you joking? And this is like one of these ancient monastic doors. So there's like literally one key. He goes, there's no other key. And so he got one of the, one of the workers in the monastery to try to open the door. They couldn't open the door. And then he's sitting there and I go, and he's sweating because he did all this effort and then we can't get inside. And then I said to him, listen, I'm not wasting my time. Just break the door. And he goes, we can't break Pope Nicholas's door. I said, just break the lock and get a locksmith. He goes, but it's an ancient lock. And then eventually, a Bona Philemon, who was with me and suffering for weeks, I think clicked it at that point. He said, just open the door now. And so he goes, okay, okay. So then they broke the door open. We get inside. By this stage, the monk that I was speaking to, I think, had the feeling that God is making it very clear we shouldn't be in here. That's why it's become so difficult to get in. What's the odds of the, the, the key being locked on the inside? So he started to stress. And I see him sweating. He's just pouring down water. And he goes, look, look, I, I was making it up before. There's no letters. I was just trying to make myself look like I'm special. But there's nothing. There's nothing. And then I go to him. I didn't go through all this effort. You're lying to me. Look, I don't talk about this a lot, but I'm a very perceptive priest. You know, I see through people's eyes. You're lying to me. He goes, no, I'm not lying. I go, show me where the letters are. And he goes, there's no letters. I go, I know there's letters. He goes, there's no letters. He goes, I, go, I know he goes, I, there's no letters. I go, why do you keep looking over there? <laughs> I promise you, this is exactly what happened. He goes, nah, no, my fish hag, nothing, nothing. I didn't, I didn't look there, I didn't look there. And I go, let's just go have a look. <laughs> so we go over there and there's this bunch of plastic bags and papers just thrown on the ground, which you'd never think anything of them. It looks like rubbish. We look at the bags and I see him stressing. He's like sweating. He's like palpitating. Something's wrong. And I go, these are the letters. He goes, look, Abuna, look, Abuna, I don't want to get in any trouble. I said, the bishop gave you permission. The Pope's letter is here. We've got no problems. I'm a priest. I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass your monastery. We just need to see the letters. And there was something like three or four hundred letters over there. About a hundred of them were for Pope Carlos. The other three hundred were historical letters from the monastery before the period of Pope Carlos and afterwards. A lot of them were in plastic bags, but just thrown there. That's their storage. And so a lot of them had water damage and other things. Um, so it was incredible. So we found those letters. That was another collection. Then the third, do we have time? I'll tell you the third mm -hmm. one. Then the third one, um, I went to Baramus Monastery, where Pope Carlos started off as a monk. Mm -hmm. There, they have archives, but they wouldn't let me go anywhere near them. So there was a big issue that when Pope Carlos left the Baramus Monastery, after solitude, there was a, a lot of conflict between him and the monastery after that point. And so there was a lot of suspicions that carried through even after, even like in the, year, you know, in the 2000s. And so they were very wary, it wouldn't let me speak to anyone, and it was very closed off. So I don't know what exactly they had, but it would have been anyway from the very, very early period, which I had most of those letters because they were written to his brother anyway. Then I went to um, Abu Narafi Lavamina, St. Mina's monastery, and he's a real holy man. Like you're in his presence, it's quite scary to be in his presence. And so we're talking, talking, I'm interviewing him, interviewing him. And I went through about two hours of interviewing before I could just say, okay, so where are the letters? And then he goes, no, 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 no we talk about there's no letters. And I say, look, Abuna, when I read your, your books, you put snippets of the, of the letters. And some of the Arab books actually even photocopy the original letter. So where are the letters? He says, La, Abuna, I burnt them all. I said, why? He said, too many of the letters had things in them. I didn't want to have any, so I, I got rid of them. I said, Abuna, please, there has to be letters. No, nah, there's no letters. There has to be letters. And we kept arguing, arguing. But I've, the letters that you have, I have the originals from St. Samuel's Monastery. I've seen them. That means that you must have a copy of those letters. I reckon that you went around originally when you were doing your research after he died, and you made copies of all these letters, and that's why you have so many of the letters. That's why they're in your books, little snippets, little lines. He said, no, 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 there's no letters, no letters. I just, I wrote things. I said, no, there must be letters. And eventually he got sick of me. And then he goes, all right, let, let me think and pray. So he went and disappeared for an hour. He came back later and his galabia was covered in mud. He was okay, here you go. And dropped probably about 10 kilograms of letters. He had buried them under the ground and was actually thinking of destroying them, genuinely. And so then I walked out of his cell with these, these 20 kilos of letters and as I was walking out, all the monks were just staring at me. Like, what are they? Where do you get them from? And then, they, are they Pope Carlos's letters? Because they knew I was doing research on Pope Carlos. They go, why do you give them to you? Who are you? And I was like, I'm a nobody. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason, I don't know what it was, perhaps Pope Carlos moved him. He gave his, and so then we went and digitized all of these letters. Um, so there was the hundreds of letters. A lot of them were, the, were copies of the other letters, but a lot of them were unique. Um, so it was really incredible. So it was really miracles. Because really, 
I had no success. Like, I would have had no luck finding any of these things if it wasn't for just very unique circumstances coming together. Because people have mm. tried before. Yeah. Sabun Rafi told me that a number of people have tried and done research before and he's given them nothing. You know? mm. And he doesn't know me from Barasat. Did, did you feel that um, it was Pope Krollos who wanted this stuff to be revealed that aided the way for yeah, you? Yeah, I think absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Because, I mean, the reality is many people have tried before and been unsuccessful. I was there in a very short period of time. So if things didn't work out, Nothing would have happened. Mm. Karim. Mm. Um, I think the, the autobiographical fragments. So, oh, sorry, sorry. So the question was, were there any letters that stood out more than the others? I think um, one of the things that I found with Father Rafael Avimino was there was an intact copy of his autobiographical fragments, like where he, he started to write his autobiography but then stopped it. Um, that was very interesting to read that in full. Um, that was a very interesting one. There were just some letters which were very simple, which, which gave you a sense of his just humanity almost. So one of the letters, for example, he's writing, and he's writing about a very spiritual topic to somebody, and then he stopped. He goes, anyway, anyway, he goes, the ink's running out and the lentils are overcooking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's only stopped the letter, you know. <laughs> um, there's little things like that. But then some of them were very dramatic. Like I said, the one about when people ask for healing, he said, I've asked Samina, you know, he said it's happening, just assure me of the good news when it happens. Um, and then there's some very beautiful letters. Like there's one letter that he wrote to, one of the very few letters actually that we have a copy of, that he wrote to Pope Shunura when he was ordained a priest. So Pope Shunura Nazir Gayud was a young man that was his disciple that became a priest. And he wrote to him and he said to him, um, never forget the one grace of your priesthood. He goes, when you bow down before the altar, especially during the consecration, then in Epiclesis, when the Holy Spirit transforms the bread and the wine into the body and the blood of Christ, he says, at that moment, Heaven is open. That is the moment you pour out your heart before him. And I think things like that give you a sense of how he was living himself. Um, so there were some really beautiful things like that. Um, yeah, so I was very lucky, because my Arabic is terrible, that just before I started, I was actually going to stop because I'd realized the, the resources in English were very limited. Even if I was going to translate things, there's just too much. There's too much, too many volumes of history, too many things that I can't access in English. Um, and so I was considering actually thinking about pulling out and changing topics. At that point, um, this little old lady, which she went, I'm not allowed to mention her name, she came to me, she was a professional translator, and she said to me, Abuna, um, for various reasons in her life that I'm not going to go into, I can't serve and I can't do other things. She goes, but I can translate. Is there anything you need me to translate? So I said, oh, well, plenty. So she had heard that I was doing something, but didn't know exactly on what. And I said, I've got plenty. So then I sent her one document just to see her quality of translation. She came back, typed Microsoft Word document, perfect, within like an hour. And so she translated, I think, I, I checked her recently, possibly between 10 and 20,000 pages of documents. You don't know what I did to this poor lady. I gave, she actually translated books just because I needed to find that if there was a connection of something that happened in the 1960s in Muslim Brotherhood and this. She translated it. Whole books. She was really a gift from God. You know? um, and one of the most beautiful things is what we were, was watching her because she was the first person in, you know, in 67 years that's reading these letters. You know? And her joy, because Pope Carlos was a patron saint, was really beautiful. But it was, she was a gift. Again, that was 100% a miracle. Mm -hmm. The timing mm -hmm. and the way that she came to me mm -hmm. um, was incredible. Andrew? Yeah, so it's, it, it, it's on my... Um, are the letters compiled, that was the question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, the question is, are the letters compiled? Um, so it is in my to-do list that there is a volume that was supposed to come out from St. Vlad's, um, which is a collected works of the translations as well as some commentary to kind of give a bit of context. Um, it's on the back seat while I finish another book, but we'll see when I get there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very tenacious, so very annoyingly so. Um, so I pushed each one of these three very, very hard. And then, but there was one person I pushed very hard that wouldn't have, didn't want to look at me. Um, there was a disciple of Pope Carlos that was in the monastery with him 
uh, sorry, that was within the patriarchate with him after Abu Rafil Avamina, uh, who was the disciple of him from, I think, 1966, 67 to 1971, so the last part of his life. And he's now a hermit at Baramus Monastery. He refused, flat out refused. I tried every method. I pulled in every connection. He was a hermit. He wouldn't even look at me. He didn't want to have a conversation with me. Um, so I took that. I mean, he's apparently very silent. And I took that as a sign, really, that God, for some reason, you know, didn't want to reveal that part of his experience. Maybe towards the end of his life, um, the level of spirituality that was so intense, maybe God didn't want that revealed. I, I don't know. I don't know. Or he just didn't want to speak to the Australian priest. <laughs> John, did you have a question? Mm. Oh, that was yours, okay. Mm. Yeah, Dan. Uh, because a lot of them, the people that own the documents, a lot of them are personal letters. So, for example, most of the letters that went to Pope Carlos' brother were about personal things. So, for example, something that's happening in the family, whatever else. And so, understandably so, they didn't want a lot of that revealed. And it's very hard to, there might be a paragraph which is spiritual, but there might be a paragraph which is personal. And so they were a bit hesitant about that. At the same time, sometimes I think some of the monks were worried there'd be something revealing that would cast Pakralis in a negative light. But it was actually the exact opposite. The exact opposite. Um, mm. But it's very understandable. And so I made, obviously, promises to them that I wouldn't kind of reveal those letters until I did it in an edited collection with commentary and, you know, select, uh, carefully selecting them. That question was, why was there so much hesitation around revealing the letters? Um, Fairly? The question is, uh, did he feel anything from Pope Carlos helping you along the way? No, I think probably just in, in those kind of practical ways. Because, uh, like I said, a lot of them were quite impossible. You know, Those journeys were random, right? And so I've got a six-hour drive. At the end of it, you're just lucky if the monk that you want to speak to happens to be there. Or the person that you arranged a meeting with ends up being there. Um, so I think those kind of things. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, wild goose chases along the way as well, which, you know, three, four-hour drives to meet a bishop who's got no idea what he's talking about or a priest who says something and then they're confused. And so there's a lot of things like that as well. Mm. Um, but I think, I think just along the way, you know, no doubt there was, you know, a bit of, a bit of support. All right, we've reached the end of our time, but there's, there's three more things I just want to ask quickly. Maybe you can answer them in one minute each, Abuna. Um, the first is, is around asceticism. Um, we're fasting Lent now, and, and often when we, when we do ascetical practices like fasting Lent or abstaining from food, um, we can question, like, what's the point? Like, why, why am I suffering like this? Why don't I just eat whatever I want? Or why don't I just eat, eat a bit earlier? Or why am I giving up this coffee? Or, you know, we question, what's the point of it all? Um, but when you look at saints, um, you find this common trend of lives of asceticism, uh, especially Pope Carlos. Obviously, he lived a very ascetical life. Um, he did describe very quickly and briefly what his ascetical life was like and how it impacts holiness, um, perhaps to give us a bit of encouragement in our ascetical practices. Yeah, there's no doubt he was incredibly strict on himself, even from uh, the perspective of monk, all the way to when he was in old age. He was incredibly strict with himself in terms of his diet, what he ate, when he ate. Um, you know, Father Avamina says he would never eat even meat and chicken, even when he wasn't fasting unless they snuck it into his rice. So they cut it from little tiny pieces when he was old, couldn't see as well. That's the only way he would get protein into him. Um, and, you know, I mean, that was the way he lived his life. That was how he lived his life. That asceticism was in everything. He used to especially love prostrations, samatanyas. He used to say, and again, exactly the same words from St. Isaac the Syrian, that they terrify demons, that nothing terrifies the demons as much as prostrations. Um, so there's no doubt he, he really disciplined his body not for the sake of it, not for the sake of um, just being a master of his body and controlling everything that he did and when he did it and how he did it. No, more from the perspective of he understood that the more he was able to renounce his own desires, the more he was open to the desires of others and the desires of God. And that's how he lived his life, you know, from beginning to end, never giving in to any small desire. Um, and one of the things that's remarkable is that when you look in, the, in, in church history, 
and you look at a lot of the early saints, the, the moment they became a bishop or a patriarch, their level of asceticism increased dramatically. And I asked Father Rafael of Amina, of Amina about that, and he said to me that the, when he became a patriarch, he didn't say, well, I'm busy now, well, um, I'm old now, I need to calm things down. He did the opposite. Knowing the tribulations that would come, he humbled himself even more. He struggled even more. He ate even less. He fasted even more, knowing that he needed the strength of God from there. Um, so I think the same thing for us. I think we need to understand, as we pray in the, in the fraction of Lent, that you know, fasting and prayer really are our strength. They're our capacity to deal um, with things. And that's the reason why we fast and we pray when we're you know, in times of anxiety, in times of, of stress, in times of tribulation, mm. because then we are more open to the grace of God. Mm. Yeah. Um, next question is around just practically, you know, Pope Carlos is a modern day saint and, and, and that's very um, encouraging because we know that we can, you know, go down also this path of holiness. Um, but developing this connection and this friendship with Pope Carlos, um, any suggestions on how we can personally um, develop this friendship with Pope Carlos? Yeah, I, I think... Um you know, besides kind of just being acquainted with his life in terms of reading the book and, and, you know, reading in his life deeply about it. I think another thing is that we, you know, in our prayers, you know, we, we, we ask for his intercessions. Um, we, you know, the venerations, the tamgir as I did before, all of these things are very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And the final thing, um, we're about to start praying the liturgy. Um, and we all know that Pope Corollos, um prayed daily liturgy. Yeah. And had a deep love for the liturgy. Um, describe to us a little bit about his routine with the liturgy, his love for the liturgy, and how the liturgy was a means um, of his connection to Christ and to heaven. And then again, how that can be a reality for us, how we can use the liturgy in the same way Pope Corollos used the liturgy. Yeah, yeah I, I think the most important thing for Pope Corollos was he understood that whenever he was before the altar, he was in the presence of God in the direct presence of God. And I think that's something that we're, like I'm speaking about myself first, something that we lose, that we can become a bit desensitized, that we're not properly understanding the mystery of which we're in front of. And that means sometimes we lose reverence, you know. That means that we can sit there and, you know, as I said, talk to someone, check our phones, have a conversation, and we forget that by doing that, we're kind of in the presence of God and we're turning away from Him. And then we wonder why I don't have the feeling that I'm in the presence of God. I don't understand and not the Lord is not unveiled before me. And so I think one of the things that we can learn from him is how serious he was. You know, even when I asked when I asked his disciple, you know, was there any time that you saw him upset? He said the only time was when he had to share the altar. He goes, if he was praying and then someone would come and say, Oh, I said, No, I'd like to pray with you. He goes, No, 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 there's there's another little altar. If you go down the hall, there's a church on the right hand side, no one's praying, they go pray there. And he goes, He would be visibly distressed when he had to pray with someone else. Because for him, you're asking him to step away being in the presence of God. He couldn't handle it. And so um, this description that they kept telling me about, one of the photographs, and I started to notice there was almost a pattern. If he wasn't praying the liturgy by himself, he almost always wouldn't be in white. He wouldn't be wearing the liturgical vestments. He just stands on the side. And always grumpy with his eyes closed. It's quite remarkable to see how he was. Um, because he understood the mystery that he was in front of. He couldn't bear to be away from it. And that's why he couldn't bear not to pray daily. So I think for all of us practically, and I speak to myself first, we really have to approach the Lord in reverence. We really have to be still in front of the altar. We have to be still when we pray. We have to close our eyes and be silent. This idea of saying hi to people is, is, is it's destructive. You know, it's destructive. You don't need to say hi to someone when you're in church. Say hi to them after church. You know? um, this idea of talking of sitting down, of lounging around, uh, of not properly respecting where we are. Even the idea, forgive me, of one person standing up here and singing while everyone else is back there. Everyone should be up forward singing. Everyone should be in groups. It shouldn't just be the men. Women should be singing as well. You know? All of us need to understand the great mystery which we're in front of. You know? That we're all servants. We're all serving in the liturgy, no matter where we're sitting, at the back or at the front. That's why we call the liturgy the people's service, the Laogia literally means the people's service. That's why we have an absolution of the servants where the priest comes out and asks for the absolution of the priests, the deacons, the lay people, everyone. Because all of us in the liturgy are serving the liturgy. You know? And so I think all of us need to have that sense of really 
what presence, who in front of, like who are we in front of, you know? Um, I'll leave you with just one line, Senor Climacos, who's beautiful to read in Lent, he says that when you come to the Lord and before him get distracted, he goes, it's as though you are talking face to face with the king and then you say to him, stop and start having a conversation with his enemy, you know? And that's rough. But I think that's probably something good for us to keep at the back of our minds. Every time my mind goes, I pull it back quickly. Every time I think to have a conversation with someone, I pull it back quickly. So that really we understand the great mystery which we're in front of. And then we understand that that's where I find my comfort. I don't have to go and talk to my friend who's useless and gives me useless advice because he's a 25-year-old you know, guy. What does he know about this? I can actually go and talk to the only person that can actually solve the problem, the, person, the only person that can actually comfort me. Thank you so much, Abuna, for, for being with us um, this you. evening. I told Abuna the next book he should write is about Abuna Bishwe Kamel, but um, we'll see if he becomes obedient or not about that <laughs> one. Um, but we, we thank you so much, Abuna. Obviously, I know this, this night has, has really enriched us um, and inspired us because having somebody like Pope Corliss in front of us as a, as a role model. And so we thank you, Abuna, for the effort you, you've put in to unveil the mystery around Pope Corliss. Obviously, the, the nights, the hours, the days, the years that it took to do this. Um, no one saw your effort except God. But, you know, we thank you for that because we've, we've all going to benefit from it and many generations will benefit from it afterwards. Unfortunately, I have to share the altar with the Buna Dan now. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll pray the liturgy now and, and we'll try to be singularly focused, as the Buna taught us, the Pope Carlos was, um, realizing that Christ is, is in our midst, in our presence. We'll invite the deacons up, and, um, and Marion and the team will, will sing that song that they put together about Pope Carlos while the, while the deacons are getting ready.
thank you lord that you never leave but sent us a shepherd who returned us to you the one whom we love you restored our faith and unity your service lives on we ask for you to intercede to bring light to us once more and the Holy Spirit, peace and vacation to the one holy, universal church of God, Amen. Remember, O oh Lord, those who are unto you these gifts, those on his behalf they have been brought, and those on they have been brought, grant them all the heavenly reward. Pray for these sacred and worthy oblations, and our sacrifices, and for those who offer them. Lord have mercy. Alleluia, e e e e khun shapi, wa in ir shushin, te ifnuti nahrinib, o im ifnuti fi etafti, im ibunu fi inti tamit, aluti na u anhi na kibun, Fnuti, penuti, khin u ki thara Ari if me vib choice in David Nim tib me tirim rav shitirs Al-Lilo Spirit, one God, blessed be God the Father, the Pantocrator. Amen. Blessed be His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Father, one is the Holy Son, one is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Lord God forever. Praise the Lord, all you nations, profess Him, all you peoples. For great, for strong is His mercy upon us and His faithful forever. Amen. Alleluia. <laughs> Oh, non, amen. 
and merciful God, the Father of our Lord God and Saviour Jesus Christ. For he hath covered us, assisted, preserved, accepted us, spared us, supported us, and brought us till this hour. Let us also ask him, the Almighty God, to keep us in peace, his blessed day, and all the days of our life. Let us pray. Lord of mercy. The Lord, Master and Almighty God, the Father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you on every occasion, in every condition for all things. For you have covered, assisted, preserved, accepted us, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Let us pray that God may have mercy and compassion upon us, hear us, sustain us, and continuously accept the prayers and supplication of his sins on our behalf, and make us worthy to partake of these holy sacraments for the forgiveness of <coughs> our sins. Lord of mercy. Therefore, we ask and appeal to your goodness, a lover of mankind, that you grant us to conclude this blessed day and all the days of our life in peace, and in your fuel envy, all temptation, all the works of Satan, all the intrigues of the wicked, Rising of enemies seen and unseen, do cast away from us, from all your people, from this holy table and this holy church that is yours. As for those things that are good and profitable to provide for us, for using the power of the dragon, serpents and scorpions, and all the power of the enemy. So So if we absolve from the mouth of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, from the mouth of the one Holy Catholic Apostolic Church, from the mouth of the Beholder of God, the Evangelist, St. Mark, the Apostle of Mark, the Patrick Severus, the Teacher of Souls, St. Anastasius, the Apostolic, St. Peter, the High Priest, and Mark, the Eastern, because also St. Zeno, St. Basil, St. Gregory, from the mouth of the 387 and I see of the 150 of Constantinople, 200 Ephesus, from the mouth of my honored father, Patrick Alvarez, the second, his brother, the minister, Shepherd, from Badania, from the mouth of my father, Father Mark, and my weak and abject soul, for blessed and full of glory is your holy name, O Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, now unto the ages of ages, Amen. Paul the servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and appointed to the gospel of God from the reading of our epistle to our teacher. For my teacher Paul to the Romans, may bless and with us all amen. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not... For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, 
an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfil its lust. The grace of God the Father be with you all. Amen. Catholic Epistle from the Second Epistle of our Teacher, St. John, may his blessings be with us. Amen. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may re receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The world is passing away in its lust, but he who desires will, he, he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. of our fathers, the pure apostles, who are invested with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May their blessings be with us all. Amen. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own also? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Have you not lied? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. 
So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to, him, uh, then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last and the young men came in and found her dead and carried carrying her out buried her by her husband so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things the word of the lord shall grow and multiply be mighty and be confirmed in the holy church of god amen In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, today is the 27th day of the month of Amashir. May his blessings be with us. Amen. On this day of the year 53 of the Martyrs, we commemorate St. Eustathius, the Patriarch of Antioch. May his blessings be with us. Amen. Also, we commemorate St. Perpetua and her companions. May their blessings be with us. Amen. And we commemorate His Holiness, Pope Carlos VI. May his prayers be with us. Amen. Just as we continue the liturgy, uh, what we'll do is that uh, one resp congregation response will come from the boys' side and the other will come from the girls' side. Um, so we can hear your beautiful voices. So please, um, girls, when it's your turn, sing very loudly so we can hear you. And we'll start now with Agios. The boys will start us and then the next Agios will be the girls and we'll continue throughout the whole liturgy that way. to his saintly disciples and honored apostles. Many prophets and righteous men have desired to see what you see, but they could not, and to hear what you hear, but they could not. But as for you, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. May we be worthy to hear and to act according to your holy gospel through the prayers of your saints. Lord, have mercy. Remember also, to all those who have asked us to remember them in our prayers and supplications that we offer up unto you, Lord, our word. God, does it really fall in asleep? Repose them. Those who are sick, heal them. For you are the life of us all, the salvation of us all, the hope of us all, the healing of us all, and the resurrection of us all. In the name of the Lord of hosts, bless our Lord the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Stand up in the fear 
of God and let us listen to the Holy Gospel. A chapter from the Holy Gospel according to our teacher, St. Matthew the Evangelist. May his blessing be with us all. Amen. From the son of our teacher, David the prophet and king, may his blessing be with us all. Amen. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. Alleluia. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, our Lord, God and Savior, King of us all, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, to whom glory is forever. Amen. Now Jesus calls his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitudes, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them and then gave them to his disciples, and his disciples gave to the multitude, so they all ate and were filled. And they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were four thousand men, besides women and children. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart. In Christ Jesus our Lord, I have sinned, I have sinned, my Lord Jesus, forgive me, for there is no servant without sin, nor master without forgiveness, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, be done, for thine is the glory forever. Jeffers Marot and Jeviot Nishirin and Bethnev Maeto Wap, Tatareya Senji Kevot and Oshem Mostenti Ones. Should we believe in one God, the mighty God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, walking with his one vision? We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the begotten Son of God, one with five full ages, light of light, true God of true God. We got an omelette called Saint Jesus the Father, the room things came to being. He did seven heaven for us and for our salvation. The decline of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary became in. He was crucified for us, the time conscious by it. He suffered and was buried and rose in the corners of the scriptures. He has sent heaven and sat at the right hand of his Father. He shall also come back in his glory, judging the living dead of his kingdom, there will be no end. Should we believe in the Holy Spirit, life and robe, cease with the Father? He spoke in the prophets in one more universe and for solid church, a conduct of the mission of sin. And we look for the resurrection of the My brethren, forgive me. Absolve me, my father. Let us pray. Stand up for prayer. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O God, the great and eternal who created man in a state of incorruptible. 
and by the life-giving manifestation of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You have destroyed the death which was introduced into the world by the envy of the devil. You have filled the earth with the heavenly peace for which the hosts of angels glorify you, saying, Glory to God in the highest peace on earth and goodwill towards all men. Amen. Pray for the perfect peace, for love, and for pure and apostolic kisses. Lord, Goodwill, O God, fill our hearts with your peace. Cleanse us from every lust, every deceit, every hypocrisy, every malice, and from every memory of evil, entailing death. And make us worthy, O our Master, to greet one another with a holy kiss, that without falling into condemnation, we may partake of immortal and heavenly gift through Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh. Exchange a holy kiss with one another. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, hear us and have mercy upon us. Let us offer, let us offer, let us offer an order. Stand in reverence and look towards the east. Let us attend. With the pleadings of the Mother of God, Saint Mary, O Lord, grant us the forgiveness of our sins. We worship you, O Christ, with your gracious Father. Forum. That means the carrying up or the offering up. The church is making us understand that we must first lift up our hearts that he may transform them before we may transform and lift up the bread and the wine that become his body and blood. So let us all lift up our hearts in reverence before him and begging him to transform them. The Lord be with you up your hearts. They are with the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is right and well. right and worthy. O you who are the Master Lord God of truth, being before the ages and reigning forever, who dwells in the highest and looks upon the lowly, who has created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is therein. The Father of our Lord God and Saviour Jesus Christ, by whom we have created all things seen and unseen, who sits upon the throne of his glory and who is worshipped 
by all the holy powers you seated stand up before whom stand the angels the archangels the principalities the thrones the dominions the lordships and the powers and look towards the east you are here around whom stand the cherubim full of eyes and the six wing seraphim praising you continuously without ceasing and saying let us attend the cherubim worship you and the seraphim placed us in the paradise of joy and when we disobeyed your commandment by the gall of the serpent we fell from eternal life and were exiled from the paradise of joy but you have not abandoned us to the end but have contacted us continuously through your holy prophets and in the last days you have manifested yourself to us who are sitting in darkness and shadow of death through your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is of the Holy Spirit and of the Holy Virgin, Saint Mary. Oh, 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 was incarnate and taught us the ways of salvation. He granted us the grace of rebirth from on high through order and spirit. He made us unto himself an assembled people and sanctified us by your Holy Spirit. He loved his own who are in the world and gave himself up for our salvation unto death which reigned over us whereby we were bound and sold on account of our sins he descended into hate through the cross He ascended into the heavens at the right hand of Father. He is appointed a day for recompense in which will appear to judge the world in righteousness and give each one according to their deeds. Let it be according to your mercy, O Lord, and not on account of our Thank you. 
executed for us this great mystery of godliness since he was determined to surrender himself up to death for the life of the world. Spotless, undefiled, blessed and love giving hands. We believe that this is true. saying, Take and eat it, all of you, for this is my body which is broken for you and for many to be given for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is true. supper, he took the chalice, mixed it of wine and water, and he gave thanks. Amen. He blessed him. And he sanctified him. saying, Take and drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, to be given for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of, of me. This is also true indeed. of this cup, you preach my death, confess my resurrection, and remember me till I come. Amen, 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 we preach your death, the Lord, your holy resurrection and ascension we from the dead, his ascension to the heavens, his each right hand of Father, and his second coming from the heavens, oh, 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 oh sermon glorious, 
We offer up to your oblations what is yours on every occasion, in every condition, and for all things. Attend to the Lord in awe and reverence. We praise you. We bless you. We serve you. Take of your holes into the purification of our souls, our bodies, and our spirits, that we may become one body, one spirit, and may have a share in heritage of all the saints who have pleased you since the beginning. Remember, O Lord, the peace of your one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. Remember, Lord, our patriarch, our Titus II, and his brother in the ministry, our bishop, and Daniel. And for those who rally to find the word of truth with them, remember, Lord, the Orthodox Hegemons, priests, and deacons, and all the ministers, and all who are in virginity and the purity of all your faithful people. Remember, O Lord. To have mercy upon us all. Have mercy upon us, God the Father Almighty. Remember, O Lord, the safety of this holy place which is yours, and every place, the country of Ukraine, and all places of war, and every monastery of our Orthodox Fathers. And for those who dwell there in God's faith, your people, your people, your people, and the church cry to you with you through you to the Father and say, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy on us, God. Face of the earth and may its furrows be abundantly watered. 
Prepared for sowing and harvesting, manage our lives as only you deem fit. Bless the crown of you with your goodness for the sake of the poor of your people, the widow, the orphan, the trial of the stranger, and for the sake of us all who entreat you and seek your holy name. For the eyes of everyone wait upon you, for you give them their food in due season. Deal with us according to your goodness, so you who gives food to all flesh. Fill our hearts with joy and gladness that we too, having sufficiency in everything always, may abound in every good deed. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O oh Lord, those who brought unto these gifts, those on whose behalf they have been brought, and those by whom they have been brought. Grant them all the heavenly reward. Pray for these sacred and worthy oblations and our sacrifices and for those who offered them. Lord, have As this, O oh Lord, is the command of your only begotten Son, that we ought to take part in the commemoration of your saints. Graciously accord, O oh Lord, to remember all the saints who please you since the beginning of our Holy Fathers, the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, the preachers. The evangelists, the martyrs, the confessors, and all the spirits of the righteous who consummated in their faith. Most of all, the pure, full of glory, ever virgin, Holy Mother of God, Saint Mary, who in truth gave birth to God the Word. And Saint John, the foreigner Baptist and Martyr, Saint Stephen, the Archdeacon, the Proto Martyr. The beholder of God, St. Mark the Evangelist, the Apostle, and Marty, the great patriarch of Acrylus the Sixth, and all the choir of your saints through whose prayers and supplications. Have mercy on us all and save us for the sake of your holy name that is called upon us. Let the reader's name, our holy. Fathers, the patriarchs who have departed, may the Lord grant repose to their souls and forgive us our sins. Take and repose them in the paradise of joy in the region of the living forever in the heavenly Jerusalem. And in that place, and we too who are sojourners in this place, keep us in your faith and grant us your peace unto the end. As it was, so shall it be.
that as in this also in all things your great and holy name may be glorified, blessed and exalted in everything honoured and blessed together with Jesus Christ, your beloved Son and the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you all. And with your To the Father of our Lord God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we as consider us worthy to stand up in this holy place, to raise up our hands and to serve his holy name. We ask and appeal to him to make us worthy to share and offer his divine and immortal mystery. He taught us that fasting and prayer expel the devil and the evil spirits. He said, This kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. <laughs> up to heaven, Daniel was saved from the lion's den. Moses practiced fasting and praying. They received the commandments inscribed by the finger of God. Also the people of Nineveh adopted fasting and praying, so God spared them, remitted their sins, and turned his wrath away from them. <laughs> Pursued by the prophets, they foretold the advent of Christ many years before his incarnation. Aided by fasting and praying, the apostles evangelized all nations, converted them to Christianity, and baptized them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Likewise, the martyrs gave their lives up for the name of Christ to declare the proper confession before Pontius Pilate. By practicing fasting and praying, the righteous, the cross bearers, escaped to the mountains, wilderness, and caves to pursue their tremendous love. For Christ the King. Let us 
us also pursue fasting by uprooting every evil and living impurity and righteousness, that we may approach this holy sacrifice and gratefully partake of him, so that with a pure heart, illuminated soul, unashamed face, sincere faith, perfect love, and unshakable hope, we may dare intimacy without fear to call upon you and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ, love God, which is by the Holy Spirit. Amen. One is the Holy Father, one is the Holy Son, one is the Holy Spirit. of Jesus Christ, the Son of our God, Amen. 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 Honoured are the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of our God, Amen. Son, our Lord God and Saviour Jesus Christ, took of Our Lady, the Queen of us all, the Mother of God, the pure Saint Mary. He made it one with His divinity, that mingling nor interchange nor alteration, and declared through the confession of one Jewish pride and the Holy Cross on our behalf. Truly, I believe that His divinity never departs from His humanity, not even a single instant, nor a twinkling of an eye, given for salvation, remission of sins. Eternal life to those who partake of him. I believe, I believe, I believe. This is so in truth. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I believe, I believe, I believe that this is true. Amen. Pray for us and for all the Christians who ask us to remember them in the house of the Lord. The peace and love of Jesus Christ be with you. Sing a psalm, hallelujah. Pray for the merit of partaking of these holy, pure, and heavenly mysteries. Lord of mercy. <laughs> Of the Lord. 
Jesus Christ fasted for us forty days and forty nights. Praise Him with harps and flutes. Alleluia, alleluia. Jesus Christ fasted for us. Forty days and forty he nights. Praise him with symbols. Alleluia, alleluia. Jesus Christ fasted for us. Forty days and forty nights. Praise Him with loud symbols, Alleluia, Alleluia. Jesus Christ fasted for us forty days and forty nights. Praise the Lord, all living creatures, Alleluia, Alleluia. Jesus Christ fasted for us forty days and forty nights. Let us praise the angels saying, Lord, to Christ, please, because of the torment. Soma toske matos mono genis teo. Meta la vonti softo ev charisti somen Xebetrike eyo ke agiob nev mati Somatos ke ematos mono genis teo Meta la vonti softo ev charisti somen Ke nien ke ai ke sto se onasto ne onon Fai bebi somanim bi esno fente bi morgeni se noti Na etan etxi evolen xito maren xebe moten tot Maren os nemni angelos nemni tagman te ebchi si nem eb khurasen teni etmin O shevolen go emmos jibi eto ven estevin Ri egon enemen uhon memen egon Shobero kenti neste ekon evolen anome teni tob Nemni se prezvete ta choi se nib marie So ti emmono na inan kiri eleison Kiri eleison Kiri elefogis ton amin es moero es moero es imnatan yokon Evan gombi es Vie Christos ben noti Amin es eshopi The King of Peace, grant us your peace, establish for us your peace Forgive us our sins, it was the power, the glory, the might of our men who would make us worthy to pray our Father. And now, my love of God the Father, the grace of God and Son, the gift and the communion of the Holy Spirit with you all, go in peace, the peace of the Lord be with you all. Happy feast of Pope Krolos. His blessings be with you and be with us all. Amen. They only made us two Urbanas, so um, it might be hard to make that fit everybody. So I might just give them to Buna Dan, he can take him home or something. <laughs> God bless you. Happy feast.